Hi, this is Judy Salinger from Lasting Recovery, San Diego's premier outpatient alcohol and drug treatment center. And today we're talking about Who misuses opiates? There's a, you know, a, a several groups, we all know this. There's uh, recreational users, there's patients with addiction, and then there's this pain issue, which is a whole other piece of the problem. I should have put that on there, right? The issue of chronic pain is another part of the opiate epidemic. Doctors treating chronic pain with opiates is, is, is part of this. Next. And so this is just a brief slide that, they, you know, chronic pain is a big problem in this country. It's not clear the chronic opiate uh, treatment is the best treatment. Ten years ago, we said that. For a lot of chronic pain problems, for example, fibromyalgia, chronic opiate analgesic therapy is not a good treatment. But 10, 12 years ago, you know, they were saying, go ahead, go full steam, guys. This is a good idea. Next, please. So, and Jayco comes around and wags their finger in 2001 and says, okay, guys, I know blood pressure and pulse and all that is important, but, but f get pain, treat pain. And then if you're a physician, a busy physician, the message is write a lot of opiates. Because, you know, fifth vital sign, okay, the patient in room five has a pulse of 20 and the patient in room 10 has a pain sa signal of nine. And Jayco dings you. These are the hospital. Jayco dings you if you don't address that. And what's the easiest way to address that is to prescribe, okay? So, so you see now this point about this being a complex problem. Physicians, regulatory agencies, market. So here we are dealing with some of the consequences. Next. So you can see, and again, I think the historical perspective is helpful. Here in 2000, these are methadone, oxycontin, and hydrocodone, tr uh, uh, numbers of prescriptions. And you can see this trend, and you'll see this graph repeat itself. So a historical perspective is, gosh, more prescriptions, and then we'll see a slide that shows more deaths. Sadly, the curves are like this. It's just a parallel. So I'm kind of passionate about this because we, as, as MDs, kind of drop the ball on this deal and are, are now trying to clean it up. Next. So this is uh, our first Olympic medalist who spun around like eight and a half times. Anybody see this? You could have heard a pin drop. Amazing. Go USA, right? He, t he said, he said he got on the, he got, he started his deal. He didn't know he was going to do it. You know, thank goodness his parents got him in a sport because this is the kind of person we see, right? Because he's like, I'll just go for it. Just throw myself off and spin around eight times and, you know, good for him. So go USA. But go USA too. Our country eats a lot of opiates. 99% of the world's hydrocodone supply is consumed in these borders. I don't think we have more opiate receptors or more pain than <laughs> other parts of the country. So if you don't think that there are regional problems, now listen, in Thailand and uh, Cambodia, they have an opiate problem and other problems. But our country eats a lot of opiates. This is, again, hydrocodone and the global opiates. This is a US problem, so go USA maybe. Next. What's unfortunate, this is a small study by Sean Mackey up at UCLA, but it's pretty clear that if you give chronic pain patients morphine for a month, you see changes in their brain. One month, chronic opiates, changes in their brain. What I don't know, and no one here knows, and, and if you do, please tell me, is are these at some point reversible? I don't know that. Part of what smart people like Kube up at Scripps, this researcher, seem to think is that after you go through this withdrawal opiate cycle a couple times, you may permanently sensitize stress systems in your brain, which is a problem. Because, you know, I, I, I recently read this book, Heal the Brain, by some guy who runs an opiate center. It'd be cool if that was true. I, I couldn't find in it any data that, the, that, there's perm that there's a permanent reversal of these kind of changes. I just don't know it. If you know some, please. That's not to say that some people don't get into recovery and stay in recovery. That's not what I'm saying. I want to know, is there biological proof that once you get in this, that it goes back to healthy? I don't know. Next. So then again, you see that, that, that pain relievers become the, the new illicit drug use. It's a simple supply thing, right? If there's a, a, a teenager who couldn't easily get their hands on opiates, he's not very well connected, unfortunately. So. <laughs> You know, if you're in the age where you're going to experiment, this is easy to experiment with. And I think it's, a, it's, it's actually awful 
that you would expose a, a, a susceptible brain, and we'll look at teen brains, to these extraordinarily powerful chemicals, it's a ba really bad deal and creates potentially a lifetime of suffering. Next. And a shorter lifespan. Thank you, yes. So this is the face of the new drug dealer. <laughs> we laugh, but next slide. I'll show you some statistics. Tell you a quick story first. Uh, a hospital administrator, I was speaking to Kaiser doctors about this problem, hospital administrator, good guy, uh, was with his mother in Florida. Um, as seeing who I'm sure was a fine provider, she had a hip problem, terrible hip pain. She was going to go in for an injection. Uh, they, uh, she took her aspirin that day. She couldn't get the injection. So the doctor didn't see the patient. Um, and again, I'm not slamming him, but he didn't see the patient. Instead, he sent the nurse out with a prescription for Medis uh, opiates. How many? 100. Why not 100? Right? Why not 100? It's a nice even number. It's kind of right. Guess where 99 of those go? Because she's not going to, she, you know, she's one of those people like my, like my uh, father who, he, he, you know, he, he could cut his arm off and he would like try to, you know. <laughs> but 99 of those are going to in, into her grandson's, right, supply. So you, see, you can link the problem now. Now this doctor, I think, was trying to help this lady, I guess, but just not thinking about collateral damage. Anybody know what the nickname for this team is? Vikes. So the Vi that's a word for Vicodin. Vicodin is also called Hydro's Magnums, 357 Magnum. They have a 357 on them, pr imprinted on them. And around the world are 360. That's the 5 and the Vicodin with 5 and 7.5 of hydrocodone. So there's this whole literature around this. And here's what you find if you break into a, an apartment with some entrepreneurs in Florida. Right? Next. Okay. And this slide, busy slide, this, the bullet point is this. If you ask people, where'd you get your opiates? They're not out in, you know, in Mexico on the, where they get them is they get them from one doctor. Okay? And, of the P and, and if you don't get them from one, and then you give them free to a friend or relative, because I just got 99 from grandma, I'm probably only going to use, so let's spread the wealth, right? So you see the ripple effect and how this becomes a mess. I'm just trying to situate this in a, in a climate of medical prescribing, of history, etc. Next. This is a simple slide. I, it always worries me that, um, anybody have teenagers? Who has teenagers? Okay. When, do you, when are their brains fully cooked? What age? Mas o menos. I told you that, I think, didn't I? I? <laughs> no, I knew that. Yeah, yeah, 25. <laughs> 25, yeah. right? So, so what, what does it mean if you start getting into this stuff when you're 19? It's mean you've, your brain isn't fully cooked. And this is your tax dollars at work. These are simply brain scans from age 5 to age 20. And you can see, just notice the color changing. This is changing in the way the brain, brain uh, uh, biology. So what you see is this is part of the ventrostrite and this is part of the dopaminergic circuitry in the brain. And if this is children and this is teenagers and this is adults, teenage brains respond strongly to rewards. That's a problem because they like rewarding things like opiates. Next. And the, 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 the free, free won't in our brain, the inhibitory circuits, develop slowly. So children have more activity in the front parts of their brains that say no thank you. And then teenagers and then adults finally. So you get more brain activity from rewards and less inhibitory circuitry and then you get exposure to grandma's 99 opiates and do the math, it's a mess.